welcome to edition 79 of All Killer No Filler podcast with me, Rachel Fairburn and Kira pritchard McLean. Just before we start, we'll do our usual disclaimer. This isn't hero worship. We do this podcast because of mutual interest in serial killers. As long as we are doing this podcast, it stops us from writing to them in prison. I can't, again, I can't really hear myself because of these noise cancelling <laughs> earphones. Which uh, is it? Is it like when you've got a really bad cold and yes. you feel like you're underwater? Yes, it's exactly like that. I don't know how loud I'm talking. I don't know what I sound like. <laughs> it's it, honestly, it's it's fucking weird, and I, I keep wearing them out and about as well. And I'm convinced I'm going to be run over. <laughs> I've definitely told this story before, but a lad I was growing up with, who's now a teacher, I saw him the other day. He was one of my exes when I was a kid, had like, a uh, father was away a lot, so he used to buy him things instead of love him. And um, he had an iPod early days. And, and one of the things about iPods, I think apocryphally, Steve Jobs had bad hearing, which is why iPods went up so loud. <laughs> So he's listening. Yeah, apparently, yeah. Um, So he's listening to this iPod, like the strokes or whatever, and he's singing along and he's got earphones in and he can't hear himself. So it's just like singing appallingly, like really badly (laughs) and like out of tune and we're all fucking laughing so much. And then he sort of like looks up and sees that we're all like crying laughing and takes an earphone out and was like, what's going on? We were like, that is the worst singing ever. And like loud and confident and out of tune. And he was like so crestful and he was like really fucking hell i genuinely thought that is the best i'd ever sung in my life before <laughs> imagine doing stand-up not being able to hear yourself completely like you know if they put noise cancelling things in yeah everything would be so off wouldn't it funny you say about stand-up when i i went to f- years ago games were on tour and i used to support them so you know because i do the tech and i do like the notes for each show i'd also like open for them to keep all the costs down and then um, I couldn't do it because I was doing this weird thing in Budapest in an escape room with someone from Benefit Street. Um, oh, so yes. White I D. Got, um, White D. She was great and told me loads of stuff about Gaddy Busey. <laughs> So a lovely friend, brilliant comedian, Pete Otway, stood in. And this is at the Chorley Little Theatre. And how it works is, if you're listening backstage, you only get the sound through the mic. So they were just like, oh, my God, he's absolutely dying. (laughs) And they could also hear, like... The noises of, you know, when you get a big laugh and sometimes it, you sort of talk through it so you're not just stood there yeah, waiting. Yeah. <laughs> or some comedians do. So you'll go like, oh, uh, no, honestly, it's true. Or whatever, you know, you'll just do like... So they could hear all that stuff and they're like, fucking hell, he's having the death of all deaths. Oh. To the point that they were like, let's go to the side of the stage so we're like ready to like give him a pep talk when he comes off. And then they walk out and he's absolutely ripping it. And the reason why he's going like, oh, dear me, it, after jokes is because they're laughing so much. But yeah... There was a bit where they were like, oh, my God, poor oh my- Pete. We've paid for this as well. Oh, that, you know what? That is fucking so funny. I would love to have, like, <laughs> that. Also, I love the, oh, let's go to the side of the stage to make sure it's all right. And also see him dying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what it was, isn't it? We're like, I've got to see this. Although I think, like, Ed from Gaines in particular would be so, like, nervous and neurotic. Like, there's been times when we've all been watching stuff. Anything to do with, like, people dying comedically. And Kath as well. Like, so if we're sort of watching... They have a thing called Snatch Game on RuPaul where they sort of, like... And, and sometimes they do stand-up stand challenges. They'll both, like, be stood up watching it and then have to walk out the room at certain points. Oh. <laughs> because it's just too uncomfortable. Oh, God. <laughs> watching someone die on stage is... Um, it can be horrible, but it also can be enthralling, can't it, and thrilling, depending on There's, the act. I think I can, I can talk about this because um, they're doing very well now and I won't name them, but one of the best deaths I saw outside of myself was in these are the kind of gigs you do when you start and you're just desperate for stage time a couple of us gigged in an armenian restaurant on cheatham hill road amazing and and we got paid in food um (laughs) and it was like i was like yeah i'll gig for food and but it was also like and and this isn't me being like it was just food i wasn't used to so it was like a beetroot thin watery soup and i was like this is I thought I'd get a pie. Like, yeah. this isn't what... This isn't what... I and it was all yeah. lovely, really traditional food. And obviously, when you, you start eating, you're like, actually, this is lovely. But I was like, okay, it's a bowl of red water when I first got it. I didn't say that loud, obviously. So, we're gigging in this Armenian restaurant. And for whatever reason, they take a dislike to this act. <laughs> and 
oh god poor poor guy he gets a point where he's just dying so hard you can see he's having like an out of body experience so there's like no laughs it's quite a bad mic anyway quite a bad setup no one had smashed it this is not him being a bad comedian this is a bad gig right and he he so he tells a joke and he you know we make those involuntary noises as Mm stand-ups he went as he told the joke and there should have been a laugh he exhaled and as he exhaled he went oh i've completely lost you haven't i Um, into the microphone not realising that we can all experience that so basically his internal monologue becomes external and so you're like tell another joke and be like oh they've gone they've completely gone and it was just like the fucking most brutal thing ever to see commentating on his own death yeah and then just like you know like whistling feedback mic and then the end of the gig no mic stand so you just have to squat down and place it on the stage and walk off can i try and guess who this is yes you can yeah is it it is yeah i don't know how i got i just got it i just got it i don't know how (laughs) is it because i must have told you You, before you've never told me this before what never but i just all the clues i got it because i imagined him going ah completely lost you i just imagined him doing it and at the time he was like smashing everything he was you know winning beat the frog all the time he was like one of the new acts who was doing really well yeah he's he's thriving now so don't worry about him it's lovely chap don't worry about him yeah he's (laughs) gonna he's gonna make loads of money from comedy and already does and you know it does stuff he's proud of so he's fine (laughs) oh i enjoyed that before we start the episode we just want to say thank you to everybody that's bought tickets for our show on the 30th of may live from the Kentish Town Forum. Uh, There are a handful of in-person tickets left. Maybe they sold out by the time this goes out. But if you want to join us online, live stream that will be up for 48 hours, go to ticketmaster.co.uk. Yeah, and we may be messaging you with a link to some exclusive merch if you're coming to the show. We discuss this and and we always want our merch to be really good, don't we? Mm. Because we always want stuff that we'd wear. Yeah. And we do use it. So, yeah, there's some exciting stuff coming up. A bag that I'm excited about, perhaps. I'm really excited mm-hmm. for the bag. And we're going to be doing some yeah. signed stuff as well. So it'll just be on sale on the weekend. It'll just be a limited edition because I hate it when everyone's got the same shit as me. Um, so, mm-hmm. yeah, there we go. We're looking forward to it. Anyway, we're uh, seven minutes in and we've not mentioned who we're doing. Shit. Gilles de Ray mm-hmm. is, is who we're doing. Gilles de Mont. Marcy Loval Baron de Rey, who is apparently the world's first serial killer. Prepare for some terrible pronunciation uh, from me in this. Mm-hmm. Gilles de Rey is supposed to have killed anything between 100 and 600 children, mostly boys, aged from 6 to 18. He was born in 1405, but it's one of those, you know, they don't really know his date of birth. Yeah. Because it's the old days. So he was born no earlier than 1405, uh, is what they say. And he was at one point the wealthiest man in Europe. Yeah, he is known for inspiring the tale of Bluebeard, which is a a thing that I used to read obsessively as a child, which you have never heard of, which surprises no, no. me. I am surprised myself that I'd never heard of it, because anything creepy, I'm there, aren't I? Mm. Uh, so, and it is creepy. Yeah, tell the story, I like it. Potted version. Yes. There's a, a beautiful young woman, standard. There's a sort of weird older guy who's has had a string of sort of wives. So um, far, yeah, so far this sounds like it could be real life. Yeah, absolutely. He works high up in telly. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it may have been one wife actually but i remember m- multiple but yeah so and they sort of all disappear oh, and he's like oh they all leave me and so he asks for her hand in marriage and loads of people are like oh i'm not sure about this and, he, and she's like you know i think it's actually quite sweet i think it's fine he's just had a rough ride so she goes to live with him and he's like here's my castle you could go anywhere but don't go behind this locked door She's like, okay, yeah. And then, you know, she reads a lot while she's there. She plays instruments and stuff. And it's like, oh, weird that he won't let behind that locked door, though. And then he's like, do you know what? I'm going away for a bit to fight or whatever. I'm going to go and do some business somewhere. Do some man stuff. the keys. Yeah, I'm doing man stuff. I've got a fire. I'm going to poke it with a stick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving you the keys. And this one opens that door, but obviously don't open it because I forbid you from going in there everywhere else. And she's like, fine. After a while, she's like, God, this is a fucking boy. Writes to her brothers and she's like, come and see me. 
I'm bored. And uh, they're like, yeah, great, we'll come and see you, you know, on this date. And then she's like, oh, I am bored, though. I am going to I am gonna go in that room. I'm just going to see what it's about. It's probably my birthday present or something like that, and he's being coy. So opens the door, and through the, like, light that shines in from the door, sees the decomposing body of either wife or wives. I can't remember mm. which one it was. I think wives. Wives sounds better. Yeah, wives sound better. So... In the various states of decomposition, these bodies um, that have been, like, beheaded. So she's like, holy fuck. And in the shock, she drops the keys. And when she drops the keys, blood lands on them. And uh, she's like, oh, shit. So she shuts the door, she locks it, and then she's, like, shaking. And she takes the keys up to the kitchen to wash them. But what she doesn't know is, oh, God, they're magic keys, Rachel. Oh, unbelievable. Like Alicia, uh, magical (laughs) keys. They are, these keys are a bunch of grasses. Oh, they're little fucking absolute. Yeah, snide, like sni- yeah. snitches. So she washes them, washes them, washes them, scrubs them, doesn't come off. So she's like, oh my God, he's going to know. So there's these blood, and their blood like moves around the keys. So she'll scrub it off one bit and they'll just appear somewhere else. And then um, she's like, oh, for fuck's sake. And then a couple of days later, Bluebeard comes back and she'd like, been like trying to come up with plans, couldn't, you know, couldn't think of anything. And he walks in through the door and she's like, hey, husband. <laughs> and he's like, you went in the room, didn't you? And she's like, no, I promise I didn't. No, I promise I didn't. And then he like snatches the keys off her and he's like, well, what's this then? And then she's like, please forgive me. I still love you. Please forgive me. And he's like, I'm going to kill you. And you're going to go to that room if you want to be in there so much. And she's like, please, no, 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 no. And he's like, I'm going to cut your head off. And then she goes, okay, 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 cut my head off. But just let me let me have a word with God before I go. Like, let Quick me have, pray. Let me just check in. Yeah, let me get my affairs in order. And he was like, fine. So she goes, or she runs up the stairs to the tower uh, and goes up to like the roof of the castle. She's like, I need to be as close to God as I can. So she's praying and praying and praying and like nothing's happening. And he's like, come down, I want to cut your head off. And she's like, no, no, I just need to do, there's something else I need to do. I just to check my straighteners are off. So she's like <laughs> praying, praying, praying. And as she's praying, she sees dust on the horizon, which is the sound of like, galloping or is her brothers galloping towards her and he's like right i'm coming to get you and she's like no just a little bit longer please just let me settle things with god and he's like okay you've got like a minute more and she's like and she's like okay i'm coming down now and he's like you're not coming down fast enough i'm gonna come and get you so she goes down and he literally has got her by the hair and he's about to chop her head off when the her brothers like kick the door down and they're like what the fuck man um because also i think i missed out a bit where she writes them being like he's gonna kill me and they chop his head off and then and the blood disappears from the key like the the curse is broken Woo! it doesn't say how what they did with all the bodies in the um in their locked room I imagine you would just, like, lock it up and paper over it. Yeah, doing a Christie. That's his name. Yeah, yeah doing Or, that. as our friend Lucas Kirkby <laughs> found out, he had damp in his kitchen. And so oh. they were taking... Did you see this? This is amazing. <laughs> During shit. lockdown. So he's, like, lovely guy. And he's got, like, a little sort of traditional house. And uh, he's... <laughs> he's got damp in his kitchen so they take out the units to try and find it and as they're doing it they find that the kitchen has just been built over the entrance to a cellar in his house <laughs> so ridiculous yeah. like how that hadn't been noticed by anyone yeah absolute madness <laughs> Uh, just to get another room out of it. It was ama- amazing. So, yes, was- Gilles de Rey inspired the tale of Bluebeard, it's said. Although that is sort of a misdirection for what he actually does, I think. Mm. Yeah, or it is. It's- allegedly does. Yeah, I mean, I can and can't see where the inspiration comes in. But, you know, the French have a little flair of their own. So absolutely, that's what they've done here. Uh, one of the documentaries I watched about this that you watched as well was really it was like from the History Channel or something. It was really bad graphics, wasn't it? <laughs> it was like yeah. he he was a war hero, and it was a man who's clearly stood in front of a green screen, <laughs> <laughs> wielding a sword round. But it's those documentaries with the um, you know, when they try and make history sexy, mm. and it, they've got the the blonde history. I'm not, I mean, I'm not taking away from it because she knows her shit, but she is very sort of hi. Yeah, that's right. I'm a historian and I'm also sexually active. Yeah. That, it's, um, I, I met another historian like that where they obviously, someone from TV walks in and be like, who's got a PhD and a great rack? Yeah. And obviously they know their shit because they're from Cambridge or Oxford or whatever. But it is that th- kind of thing of being like, oh, can we, 
can we make history sexy? And it'd be like, yeah, get an academic with a, with a leather long jacket. Hair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The men always have leather like jackets jeans. on, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> skinny jeans. Oh, dear. Anyway, Gilles de Ray, his parents were very, very wealthy. Mm-hmm. He had a little brother, and his parents died when he was 11 years old in 1415. And he and his brother Oof. were placed with his grandmother, Jean, Jean de Crayon. <laughs> I don't know why I find that so funny, but I no, do. I find it funny as well. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I used to. I don't know. Why I mentioned this. I used to eat crayons as a kid. What? Yeah, I don't know why. I'm sure he had that weird thing that P. It's called PK. I used to eat soap, yeah. washing powder, and crayons. What? Yeah, very weird. What Secret, does it taste like? Uh, crayons just taste like they smell. Okay. Not a preferred snack of mine, mm-hmm. and uh, soap tastes like has soap. <laughs> washing powder it has quite a. I used to quite enjoy the dipping my finger in and eating it. Very weird thing, isn't it, that? Yeah, because isn't it really, like, chemically horrible? Well, it's poisonous, isn't it? Um, <laughs> so, I, I mean, I'm still here. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not advocating it, by the way. Anyway, Jean de Crayon. Now, he was a very intelligent child, we have to say. He was fluent in Latin. He was always illuminating manuscripts. He had a very good education and uh, he did join the military. He had military discipline that he was interested in and he was very interested in moral issues and that kind of stuff. He sounds like a right little mm. cunt, cunt, to be quite honest. Well, I think he actually sounds like he's... Of considering... He's, he's from one of France's, like, oldest, most respected distinguished sort of aristocratic families Mm -hmm. and the fact that he's taken the time to be like you know I'm gonna learn stuff and I'm gonna think about morality I actually think that that's not what I expect from people from posh families god he must have been I I don't expect them to give a shit about stuff like that so I on paper I'm like oh he sounds all right actually (laughs) or if we're talking about manuscripts on vellum, <laughs> lovely little joke there for the uh, for the people that might have worked in a rare books library at one point. <laughs> um, <laughs> absolutely wasted. This, <laughs> this military service by fifteen, he'd successfully fought in the military, and he was part of the Hundred Year War. And he fought in wars against the Duchy of Brittany. And then he went to Anjou, is it? Mm -hmm. Uh, And he fought for the Duchess of Anjou against the English in 1427. So he came back from that and he was really celebrated as a soldier and a leader and lauded, basically. And so he was given two things. He was given the fleur de lis on his uniform, which is weirdly, is normally given to towns who have shown particular loyalty Ooh. to the crown basically or you know the, yeah the the crown and he got it and Joan of Arc got it who was one of his besties and Joan of Arc plays quite heavily in this story actually yes i should say as well Jeanne de Crayon who i cannot get over for some reason <laughs> uh, she uh, she tried to arrange a when he was 12 years old she wanted him to to be betrothed to to marry a 4 year old Jeanne Penel, who was one of the richest heiresses in Normandy, but that failed. Um, so I just find it all very strange. Having said that, why did it fail? Maybe because she's four and she's not into him. <laughs> oh wait, was he an adult at the time? He was twelve. Which I guess oh, that's in, so strange. I guess in terms of maturity and lifespan, I guess that was. <laughs> quite an adult age for the 1400s <laughs> imagine that imagine being a 12 year old and like this annoying four-year-old comes in and they go you're gonna have sex with her in a few years Ugh. it's mad isn't it it's an absolutely bizarre way of working it's yeah it's um he did get married though the 30th of november 1420 he didn't marry the rich child <laughs> the rich toddler <laughs> he, he married <laughs> she's a very wealthy toddler uh, he married catherine De Thanos of Brittany, uh, and they had one child, which we don't really know much about. Uh, but he became a marshal of France, didn't he? Mm. In 1429, Joan of Arc challenged the English and basically goes to war. And they made Gilles de Rey one of her personal guards. So the Dauphin did that. And the Dauphin, I thought it was potato. Yeah, I was just um, thinking about that. But it is it's the eldest son of the king. So it meant that the eldest son of the king could had certain powers. So it was the Dauphin who appointed him one of the personal guards. And they 
they went on to a fight at the Siege of Orleans and apparently he was very brave and he was praised for it. So when King Charles the Seventh has his coronation, Joan of Arc's there and they he's like a plus one and he made both of them Marshals of France, which is only to be awarded in like exceptional achievements. I guess it's like our... Is it Victoria Cross we have here for yeah. like... Acts of bravery. We should get one of those, mate, for podcasting during the pandemic. I think the act that did the thing at the uh, restaurant should have been awarded that. (laughs) (laughs) Honestly, if a lonely bugle player had come out and done... (laughs) It wouldn't have been more distracting. I've just got to say, because since you've mentioned it, it's been on my mind, the, the best death that I ever saw was I did a gig for a comedian who runs their own gigs and they're always very good gigs and very well attended and it was in the middle of nowhere like he decided to open his own gig and totally misjudged how much the audience wanted him and died at his own it- gig <laughs> yeah that's the one beat that out oh. totally misjudged <laughs> and I just remember standing at the back of the room going oh god oh dear oh no to myself oh. <laughs> and of course he overran Anyway, to cleanse the palate, let's get back to Gilles de Ray. <laughs> so he spent, he's very, very wealthy. He's inherited over 20 castles. Oh, what's that noise? Are you tapping? No, I can hear... Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. Do you know what that is? is there's a V-Lux above me and it started raining. Ah! It sounds, <laughs> it sounds like someone who's really unconfident with a keyboard learning to type. <laughs> no, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's a bit much, isn't it? It's like I'm a Foley artist. <laughs> um, but I'm always aware of it picking up on stuff that I'm doing. I think it, it happened on a couple of podcasts I did yesterday. I think it sounds quite pleasant. Anyway, so he, he decides that after he's done all this, you know, he's been in wars, he's been brave, he's been given this... So he's got loads of money, loads of castles, and he's like, do you know what? I'm going to have a bit of time off to pursue other interests. Mm. And I'm going to, you know chill out a bit and he's just he just starts spending shitloads of money now it, it constructs a chapel called the chapel of the holy innocence he officiated there in a, in a robe that he designed himself uh, he decided as well to put on a production of a theatrical spectacle called strap in for this le mystere de siege de orleans so i assume that's this mystery of the siege of orleans um i love it <laughs> when you can really translate something easily um now, this play had more than 20,000 lines of verse in it, 140 speaking parts and 500 <laughs> extras. This was basically Game of Thrones before technology, yeah. wasn't it? So he puts on this play. His, uh, it's just classic, isn't it, of somebody with so much money, like, I'm going to pursue a creative endeavour and I have so yeah, much money, re- I'll do what I want. He reminds me of um, Sir Henry Cyril Paget, who is one of the Marquesses of Anglesey who... Sp- Spent the equivalent of sixty million in like four years, um, in fact, one hundred and twenty million in four years, and would just put on plays. He reminds me of that, and because at the time when he started doing this, he had the wealth of a king. He he was richer than lots of the kings because he'd married well and he had this money anyway. Yeah. And then being in the war doing so well had improved his standing, um, and he was one of France's literally richest, most powerful men. But then things get tough for him. He in fourteen thirty. Joan of Arc is murdered and Mm -hmm. he was absolutely devastated by it. Now, there's there's some really interesting chat around this about how, why was he upset? And they basically think that he was like deeply, deeply in love with her. And that explains why he was like just constantly in mourning. And that's what the play is part of, is he sort of dedicates his life to honouring her memory and making sure that she is celebrated. And in fact, they think that the play is one of the things that sort of led to his downfall. I mean, thinking about it, the play as well, there were 600 costumes made and worn once. All the spectators got unlimited food and drink, which he paid for. So maybe he's so bereft at Joan of Arc, he's just really trying to keep busy. <laughs> like, no, no, we'll yeah. just wear these costumes once. Just once, and then we'll make new ones. I'll serve the also, food it's myself. Like, it's the shows that like promise you something, and you get there and be like, oh, we give everyone who's coming to the show a fiver. And you're like, okay, all right, yeah. what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, and then you just realise, like, oh, dear, this is the... Uh, this it's is dog shit, and I would pay a fiver not to be here. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Also, because the, spending so much money on these little endeavours, he sa- has to sell all of his, most of his castles. So he ends up having just two back. So he's just got two castles by now instead of, like, 25 or something. 
So mm-hmm. he's skin. Yeah, he, he retired to the military in 1434, has rinsed through all his cash. He's mortgaged or lost most of his land by 1435, so even just a year, to the point where his family got a royal decree mm-hmm. that forbade him from mortgaging anything else. Now, at this time, he is convinced that his family are plotting against him and a rift arises with his own family. A rift also arises generally with sort of the church and the country because of his sort of dedication to immortalising and memorialising, that's probably not a word, Joan of Arc. They think that by doing this play and building a chapel to her, that he's basically unofficially canonised her Mm -hmm. and they're not happy about it because she was burned as a heretic and he's sort of worshipping her. So he basically makes some really powerful enemies. So mm-hmm. he needed some more money. So legend has it he turns to alchemy. So he was desperately experimenting, trying to turn base metals into gold. Now, the story goes that at this time he also got into Satanism because he thought, right, well, if I make a pact with the devil, that's going to be the easiest way of gaining, firstly, knowledge, which will then give me power and money. Do you know what the, the rules of Satanism are in no. the modern terms? They are, don't harm anybody, but if somebody fucks you over, you have to seek revenge. That's how I live anyway. I know, I thought that. I mean, <laughs> like, it's just quite a... Yeah, I don't know. That, that's, the, uh, that's the rules. Yeah, they're, they're, quite, they're definitely easier than the Ten Commandments. Oh, a hundred percent. The fucking Ten Commandments, man. It's so it's Catholic school. I couldn't even tell you what they all are. Yeah, I get... Once I've done the funny ones, like, don't be cheeky to your parents and, and leave that ox alone. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> why, why is it so ox-heavy? This is what I was thinking. When I think of the Ten Commandments, the first thing I think of is a cow. Like, that's my visual <laughs> yeah. image. Oxes had great PR back when the Bible was being written. <laughs> Really good PR. They were so covetable. Yeah, you know how, like, cauliflower had a good year a couple of years ago? <laughs> and, and like, sweet potato had one a couple of years before that. And then pulled pork as well, somewhere yeah, in the middle. And, and also in the sort of the early 2000s, there was a potato wedge craze. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it just had... Oxes had really good PR at the time and so have sort of written themselves into history. So he's so skint, as you say. He gets into... Uh, a bit of the older cult. The story says that he starts trying to summon demons with magical books and uh, he gets into the, all these uh, rituals and he starts to try and summon demons and of course they don't appear because they don't exist. He, what he, then he decides to do, somebody says to him, all right, well, basically the demon's a bit upset. He's a bit shy. What he really needs is some parts of a child and that'll coax him out of his shyness. So he thinks, well, I'm making these demons angry, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to um, offer him some kids. It's all very strange, this. So as we'll get to, he actually confesses to all of this. So between 1432 and 1433, he's alleged to have, well, he says he's done it, killed, sodomised and killed children, mainly young boys. Now... All this took place at the, uh, his uh, main castle, the one that he was born in. Mm-hmm. And uh, he also moved to his second castle and he says that he killed a large number of the kids there. Now, the first documented case, it was child snatching of a te- 12-year-old boy. His surname was Judon. And he was an apprentice to a furrier called Galame. I can't read my writing on this second name, but the guy's <laughs> been dead for centuries, so I don't think he's going to kick off. Now, he was asked by Gilles de Ray's cousins. So they said they went to see him and he said, oh, can you, can you lend us your boy that works for you? Because we've got a message that needs taking. And he was like, yeah, sure, no problem. So the lad goes to the castle in the, with the intention of running an errand for them. And he never came back. Now, two noblemen went to the furrier, who was like, where's my lad? And they said that he'd been um, carried off by thieves and turned into a page boy. So, okay. all right. <laughs> so they were like, all right, OK, that's a bit weird, cheers. Now, what he used to do to these children was he'd sort of pamper them for the evening. He'd give them fine food, he'd give them amazing clothes like they'd never had before. He'd give them food and wine. He'd give them a thing called Hippocras, which is a mulled wine. He'd get them a little bit drunk. And he would take them to a room that only he and his close circle were allowed in. And apparently, this is what his bodyguard said, who was later named as an accomplice. He said that Gilles Duray stripped the boys, usually boys, occasionally girls, and he hung them from ropes with a hook. 
And I'm really sorry, because this is going to get really graphic, but I feel like we should say this, because this is what, you know, we admitted to. Apparently you masturbated on them, the belly or the thighs, and you touch the, uh, the genitals and the bottom, and then you'd take the kid down and comfort them, and then as they were being soothed, they would decapitate them, cut the throat, or just break the neck, and then God. there was a, a brandmark sword that was kept in the room for executions, and they said that uh, he would actually abuse the victim after death as well. Now, he said, Gilles de Ray said, that when the children were dead, he kissed them, and those who had the nicest limbs, he admired them, and uh, he cut them open to look at their inner organs. Now, often when the child was dying, he would sit on the stomachs uh, and like to see them die, and he'd used to laugh at them. Yeah, and apparently he really enjoyed... He'd sort of get, get them a bit drunk, put them in nice clothes, lead them through to his bedroom... And then they'd be pounced on by his accomplices and that's when he would explain everything that he was going to do to them. And apparently he uh, used to love that how frightened they got and really enjoy the torture element of it. And in some of the cases, he'd remove the heads to keep the nicest Ugh. ones and would compare them. Ugh. It's so gruesome, isn't it? Uh, it is. She, she said with glee. But I think it, it gets really interesting in the last section of this because it's so gruesome. Can I just... Uh, th- this is a link to something that is kind of related to this, but it's not. But it's just about my memory about a story about a Bart Simpson sticker. So Tim, my boyfriend, has a sticker on his fridge of Bart Simpson showing his bum. You know, the... the He's one of the iconic Bart Simpson images, isn't yeah. it? You know, he's, he's showing his bum. He doesn't give a cow, man. He's naughty, but also he's <laughs> lovable. So this sticker's on the fridge. It's like, oh, there's Bart Simpson, whatever. Didn't think of it. So a, a, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, I started telling him this story, which is true. I don't know how we got onto the subject, about a man in Germany, I think it was, who went to prison for possessing child pornography what the pornography he had was the animated pornography of cartoon characters. So mm. he had... I don't think he downloaded it for anything sexy. I think he downloaded it as in, ha, 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 this is funny. But it'd be things like Bart mm. and Lisa getting off of each other and stuff like that. And yeah. So it was classed as, as child pornography in the courts. Now, I t- he was like, oh, God, that's, you know, oh, well, you can have a real discussion around that, can't you? Blah, blah, blah. I was like, yeah, yeah. I had this conversation. <laughs> a few days later, I go to the fridge to get something out. And a new sticker has appeared on Bart Simpson <laughs> on his bum, <laughs> like a little sticker of a cross <laughs> put on Bart Simpson's ass, right? <laughs> so I was looking at it going, why is that sticker? And I went, have you put a sticker on Bart Simpson's bum because I told you about that man who got d- done for child pornography but it was cartoon characters? And he was like, <laughs> yeah, I think I might have done. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> That's Talk so about funny. Fucking paranoid as fuck. Oh, dear. I'll take, that, a, also, I'll take it's, a picture of it and, and send it to you. It's kind of more incriminating. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Being like, don't look at his bum hole, that's his naughty place. Because, <laughs> oh. like, you just see a picture of, like, Bart Simpson and it's totally unsexual. But when you're like, don't look down his bum hole, it just makes it all feel a bit more real. Yeah, but now I'm thinking, has he been secret looking at Bart Simpson thinking, he's got a nice bum? Is this what's been going on? Have I, have I unlocked something in his mind that he's like, oh, God, no. <laughs> he has got a good bum, though, Bart Simpson. It's quite, like, thick, isn't it? It's quite yeah, juicy. Yeah, it's quite, quite a juicy... I, don't, I mean, I don't want to sexualise a ten-year-old boy, but, uh, yeah, he's got a... Voiced by a woman. <laughs> he's got a nice ass. <laughs> Do you know what? It's not said enough. No one compliments Bart Simpson on his fucking great ass. <laughs> Don't imagine if we went to prison for this. What are you in for? <laughs> I said Bart Simpson had a nice ass. <laughs> oh god! Oh. Right, uh, okay, let's get on with this. So I had to say the bodies, uh, as you say, he did cut off some heads uh, and, and and admire them and all the rest of it, and he'd offer up nice bits of the children to to these demons. But the bodyguard said many of the bodies were burned either in the room. And the victim clothes were then thrown onto the fire to minimise the smell. And um, some of the bodies were thrown in cesspits or in a moat. Mm-hmm. Gross. Really gross. The last recorded murder, because it's kind of bookended all this. The last, last murder was the son of Eno de Villablanche. And the bodyguard said he paid 20 old coins, whatever the currency was, to have Paige's doublet made for the boy. 
Um, so he got in this fine outfit and, you know, had him all tarted up and stuff. And then he assaulted, murdered and incinerated him in August 1440. Oh, God. Yeah, so hot. I mean, the whole thing, it, I think it's so fucking gruesome, this one, isn't it? Yeah, but that's why it's fascinating. So all these rumours are going around about, in particular, peasant children going missing in different parts of the country. And how it all comes about, basically, is he's not arrested for the child stuff first. He basically comes undone when he falls out with a local clergy and he deals with it by kidnapping a priest. So, <laughs> Which, I know it's not funny, but it is funny. <laughs> it's a bit funny. It's a bit funny. So he kidnaps this priest and there's an ecclesiastical investigation. And while that's happening... People go, listen, are you going to investigate him for the kid murders that we know he's doing? And he's, you know, goading these children away with gifts and chocolates and toys and stuff. And then he's killing them. So he's arrested in September of 1440 for that. Mm -hmm. And he's brought to trial in Nantes. This is really interesting. It's the Bishop of Nantes takes him to trial. Then it goes on to civil court. Now, at first, he refuses to plead at the trial at all. But he is threatened with excommunication, which this is the first interesting thing for me. He was absolutely terrified of being excommunicated, which doesn't make sense to me if he is a Satanist and he's he's offering children up. So mm. he declared himself not guilty. They basically said, we're going to excommunicate you and we can torture you today or, you know, you can give a plea and we'll torture you later. Because so he actually, says, OK, you, well, I'm not... you saying that's really interesting because... If he was, I never thought of that. If he was so religious, he would really, it shouldn't, he really, he would have really put his faith in God and, yeah, uh, instead of going into the occult because that is a, a huge sin, isn't it? Well, yeah, so I think he's absolutely innocent. So I'm going to lay out the case now. The fact that he builds a chapel says to me that he's very religious. And mm -hmm. the fact that he, they said, right, we're going to excommunicate you. And he's like, okay, 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 I'll, 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 I'll admit. But what's really interesting is, the confession that everything is based on, he doesn't actually confess. His original confession is that he confesses to owning a book on alchemy, which alchemy was an illegal thing, but only if you had made a pact with the devil over mm -hmm. it, which he did. He said, no, no, no. He said, I've got a book on alchemy. So, yes, I, I admit to that. I'll go to trial for that. Mm -hmm. And then... The next day, when they were like, we're not going to torture you today, but we might torture you very soon, after this, basically, the day is going to be tortured, suddenly this confession that he hasn't written, that monks have written, comes out that is full of all this incredibly graphic detail. Really sexual, really violent. In fact, during the trial, they refuse to read some of the sexual stuff out, but they keep all the violence in. So somewhere along the line, these monks and bishops and priests have come up with this confession mm -hmm. overnight when he's being tortured. So but they basically think they wrote it and then it made him sign it under torture. And we all know that confessions extracted under torture more often yeah. lead to false convictions. And so Also, and, and I think a fact that I forgot to mention before, because his family got involved and there was a court injunction or whatever passed, People that had bought his castles weren't allowed to sell them. Mm. So that was another thing, which also makes me think all of this might have been a bit of a, a stitch Bullshit. Up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're right that you've suddenly got lots of, you know, you're rich enough to buy a castle, but you can't get rid of it and you can't yeah. do anything with it because of this trial. So there's suddenly lots of very rich, influential people who have skin in the game of making him disappear. And in fact, the Duke of Brittany oversaw the trial. He was prosecuting and... <laughs> He wanted him gone because mm. how it worked with the court case is if if he was either uh, thrown in prison or executed, Gilles de Rey, then the Duke of Brittany would inherit all of his land. Oh, so like, what greater motivator is there to to basically stitch someone up than you inherit a man who, let's not forget, is as rich as a king at this point? Also, his family are against him because they're like, "You're spending all our money on making mm -hmm. plays about Joan of Arc, you mad fucker." <laughs> Um, so the only evidence of satanic stuff was he'd read one book on alchemy, which he, he said, yeah, I have done that. Fucking hell, it's a, it's a bit like a, he's read one book on alchemy, right? I read Jordan <laughs> Peterson's book once, doesn't make me an incel, okay? <laughs> and the main problem with that book is it's fucking boring. <laughs> Honestly, I swear to God, it's one of the most boring books I've ever read. And I can't believe I got through it. 
or why I got through it. But anyway, let's continue. I, lis- I listened to a really good podcast about him being like this really interesting brand of fake intellectualism that people who think they're clever but actually don't have the power of like critical thinking or I guess formal academic scrutiny think that what they're reading is really clever and anyone who's an academic is like this is all horseshit yeah, you yeah, can't yeah. just assert that and he cherry picks from different cultures and different schools and stuff to be like don't I sound wise by like blending it all together yeah yeah um, yeah, yeah it's interesting actually I mean I find it I find the whole thing around him quite interesting anyway for many reasons because I like you say I I, I think he's not as intellectual as he'd like to think and I think his ideas are just a bit like yeah okay mate you know he takes like a simple idea like make your bed and tries to make it into this life-changing thing (laughs) but but also i mean it's like people say that he shouldn't be allowed to do his tours or whatever i'm like let the guy speak you'll realize that he's fucking tedious (laughs) i think lots of people won't is that is the thing is that like he's able to radicalize people who aren't able to sort of listen to him and realize that he's appealing to the not the worst things in them but the things that allow them to blame everything but themselves for their circumstances, i.e. women. Oh, yeah, he's got a problem with women, 100%. Some of the relationship stuff that he talks about, I'm like, fucking hell, you're an incel, mate. Oh, you would be an incel if you weren't married. Well, I think he's actually lost his mind, right? He's taken loads of mad psychedelic drugs and is, I think, like, sectioned at the moment or something. Oh, he's in... He's got, he had to... Why do I know so much about him? Fucking hell. He, he's had... Uh, I think he's had cancer. But him and his daughter... Are just just eat meat they don't they don't have like a they yeah. have this like really weird diet where they just eat meat which cannot be good yeah. it, his toilet must be a fucking mess awful anyway i don't know why i've <laughs> got a jordan peterson but it is something that i'm interested in and i, I defy anybody that has read that book to, to discuss it and say that it was interesting if anything it was a walk uphill through treacle <laughs> stephen fry um <laughs> <laughs> so he's accused of like killing hundreds of boys when he gets to trial they sort of talk more about 40 only 12 of which are ever given a name or 12 like missing boys and when it's talked about it's talked about god like oh god it's left behind hordes of weeping families but like the court documents at the time say oh no he there was no one in the court. There were no families present. So the witnesses were basically people who'd overheard rumours about him Mm -hmm. stealing kids. And there was this sort of theory that, like, oh, all these kids are going missing in X part of the country. He was like, well, I wasn't there. How could I have done Mm. that? And they were like, you um, sent these two old women out to get the kids for you to pick them. And then so they got these women, these old women in as witnesses. They had completely contradicting stories, like none of their evidence made sense. So it was just all this sort of like really flimsy evidence. There was no physical evidence. So Mm -hmm. considering he's meant to have killed like 100 boys and a few girls in his house and burnt them in the fireplace, there was no dust there was no bone fragments there was nothing mm-hmm. in the moats there were no kids clothes so there's no physical evidence there were no actual witnesses except the accomplices who'd also been tortured and they all had mm-hmm. completely different stories it was just basically a case built on it, it reminds me so much of what's happened throughout history with satanic panic which what happened with QAnon is that you have like scared people mm-hmm. who are weaponized by people who want to grab power mm. and what they do is they go a pe- a satanic pedophile is trying to steal your children mm. and you can get and these children have never existed and you can get them to believe re- i mean look at QAnon like really really extreme sets of beliefs there mm-hmm. that have never come to fruition that have never been proved and these people think that they're protecting children i think some of them don't but like some of them are truly there because they are worried about their kids yeah or kids in general well, and they basically some, weaponize people's fear i mean some of the people that oh God, i'm so interested in this stuff some of the people that get involved in q and on are on the surface like i watched a documentary about it there's like you know a mother of three who is mm. a, a sane person who has gone down the rabbit hole of these message boards and has now gone like, oh my God, this must be true. Mm. Um, I think it, yeah, I think you're right. It's when people don't feel like they've got any grip on anything or, you know, it's like 
oh, things are shit, this can't be it, there's got to be something else. But it's the same with Jordan Peterson. It's the same people, like, they're inquiring minds, so we shouldn't, like, talk them down. Mm. All these people who are sort of, like, I guess fringe elements and then they're so easily crossed into other things that like you know if you're cuban on you're you probably also open to the idea of flat earth and these people are you know when i watched that documentary on flat earth there's a really interesting bit where a scientist said that these people have got the mind of scientists they're curious they question everything Mm -hmm. they have just been like led down the wrong path and like you know preppers like that's that's usually a like what's it called like a rational fear yeah or an irrational fear made a, into something that you can deal with so have you if you watch the program on preppers on netflix i, I haven't seen it now it's fucking brilliant <laughs> although it has now led to a problem in our household but basically <laughs> nearly all of these preppers have a inciting incident that makes them feel like they need to prepare for the end of the world i'd be interested to know what my partner's is because the other day we were tidying something um we got like a room that we keep like the shoes in not that sounds like really bougie i mean it's literally like it's covered in mud because it's where the boots get kicked the off boot right? room. I don't yeah. know what, boot room yeah and there's a shelf in there that i can't reach and we were sort of tidying everything i was like what's all that stuff up on the shelf it's normally where like old pin- paint tins have been put and he was like um i was like what is that it's, what was those packets and he was like nothing and i was like what is it and he was like um, well, I got really drunk the other night and then the a few days later a load of prepper stuff turned up. So there's like <laughs> wind-up torches, like oh water purification stuff, masks. And this is at the beginning of what? the lockdown. What? So I think it was him sort of taking a really scary thing of us both like losing our jobs, like not knowing what's going to happen, being worried about our friends and family. And he's gone, I'll get some water purification tablets. <laughs> it's a way of controlling something uncontrollable. Oh, my God. And you know my partner. That's very off brand. Yeah, like, like he's uh, he's a. Uh, uh, this is the kind of thing he would laugh at. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I can't believe he kept that from you. <laughs> yeah, it was just so funny. He was like, he was sort of like a bit jittery at first, and then he was just like, obviously, openly laughing at the fact that he <laughs> was like, just he was like, yeah, I I got drunk and I. I'm now a prepper. <laughs> I was like, okay, fine. Is that what you have to do? You just get really hammered and then it just turns out that, oh, shit, I feel a little bunker. Yeah. yeah, it's like, um, you know, some people get a hangover when they're drunk. Well, you, you, if you're a certain person, you get a bug out bag instead. <laughs> um, I'm so interested. Is he started buying tins of beans and stuff like that? No, but I always keep a million cans of everything because I always want to be able to, if people come over, cook really nice food for them. So we have too many tins anyway. Like most f- houses, I think, have yeah, always yeah, yeah. got like a base level of tinned goods. Yeah, um, there's but always But it's when it all goes... Here's my line. When it all goes in a specific bag, it's time for me to leave. <laughs> like, a, like a duffel bag. Especially if it's a, an ex-army duffel bag, yeah. Oh my god, I can see it. I can see it now. With like um tins of beans and, and those um meals that you can eat out of the packet, some stag chili, that'd be a that would be a good one. <laughs> Um, I wonder what that's oh, like. I've God. never had that. I bet that's quite nice, you know. I might try it. Yeah, well it so you know, it's a reason it's the brand leader. <laughs> Well, I might have to give it a go. Some some podcasts are sponsored by mattresses. We're sponsored by Stag Chili. Um, <laughs> and Jordan Peterson. And Jordan Peterson. Um, so Gilles de Rey is making this... It's basically being massively stitched up, I think, for the trial is for heresy, sodomy and murder of 140 kids. Ooh. But they can't... There's so few children that they can even identify. It's all hearsay. And his sort of defence is... He thinks he's sort of defending the charge of, at first of this, reading this alchemy book, and then he gives this false confession, and he blames it. This is such a December 28th defence. He says, do you know what? It was the mulled wine. It made me really excited, (laughs) and that's why I did that stuff. Oh, my God. Part of me wonders, is that a strategy, that if you are being tortured and you're being tortured to confess, would you just give the most paper-thin confession ever? Being like, oh, wine made me do it. I mean, Which is like thing, a fucking magnet you get. The thing is, <laughs> the, <laughs> the thing is, like, I think. I mean, if you've been tortured and say you haven't done it, talk about the worst time to have to think on your feet. Like, oh mm. fucking hell, yeah, sure, I did it. Yeah, great, I'll tell you. Yeah, it was wine. And then, yeah, I, I just mm. 
it because I mean if you've not done it I mean how how do you come up with a defence when you've not done something about the murder of over 600 kids well what I think is really interesting as well because it's so graphic the stuff that's read out in court in yeah. terms of the violence and they were like we can't even read some of the sexual stuff but the fact that it's made it down they did read some of it do you know what I think is is more of a thing is like Right, well, we now know that this is bullshit. And in fact, so he was executed on the 26th of October, 1440, as were his accomplices. They're all sentenced to death. Ugh. He was sentenced to death to be hanged and burned simultaneously. So they set fire to him and then hung his body at the same time. Ugh. And apparently, as he was going to his execution, he was very sort of calm and he was praised openly in the community and elsewhere for his good Christian behaviour and it showed because it showed penitence and that people were so impressed with how he went to his death, especially because I bet everyone's like, This guy's not even guilty. He's like this war hero that's sentenced to death. There was a three day fast after his death in his honour of how Mm -hmm. in what a Christian way he'd behaved, bearing in mind that he was going to court for basically a satanic ritual. And in fact, until the 16th century, they used to celebrate the anniversary of his execution by whipping their kids. <laughs> Fucking hell. So he was executed in 1440, but by 1443, there were people trying to clear his name. They were like, this was fucking horse shit. So people were like looking into it and be like, this is not right mm -hmm. at all. Like, this is bullshit evidence. In fact, there isn't any evidence in the stuff. Mm. None of it makes sense. None of the witnesses agree. The old women that they said were going out to fetch things that didn't make any sense so then they're accusing him of stealing kids in areas that he didn't even live in like nothing stacked up also children that never existed anyway but what i want to know is when you're reading out those mm -hmm. fucking accounts in court which you've read out that you know they're like really graphic sexual violence here's an idea guys arrest the fucking monks that mm -hmm. came up with that if you've got that in your head that you can just reach in there, dip in and write that kind of thing, then I want to see your fucking search history. <laughs> do, do you know what uh, I think might have happened there? Because obviously back then it was only rich people or monks that could write. I think somebody probably dictated that to them and they had to just write it. I think, I think. they fucking sexed it up, like the, um, <laughs> the dossier in Af <laughs> Afghanistan. Whoever wrote that, it was the same people. Um, do you think the monks brought out their sexual frustration into the... Yeah. Uh, yeah, is that what you think that's <laughs> happened? <laughs> oh, God. Oh, don't make me laugh. Fucking monks are such a weird thing anyway, aren't they? Such a yeah, bizarre... I just... So he was, he was executed, I think, for a crimes that are just every now and then in history, every few years even, this satanic panic thing happens and it's usually to... You should get someone from power who's kind of trying to do good. The only thing I can see is when he... I don't think him kidnapping a priest was the best idea. But also no. I'm now like, oh, well, I don't believe any of that. Is that just like, he's like, we're going to talk about this at my house and they have a fight about it. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, yeah. I just think that it's so weird. That, and they just made everything sinister. So he built this church in, in honour of Joan of Arc and did that massive play. And there was a choir in the chapel and it was they were a hand-picked boys choir. And everyone was like, oh, hand-picked boys. And it's like, well, why didn't he murder them then? Like, if he's got access to all these boys that revere him, you just make a few of them go missing. But none of that is ever documented. It's absolute bullshit. They held a another fake trial for him in 1992. He was exonerated with that trial but i don't think he's ever been officially found innocent mm, interesting even the occultist the famous occultist alistair crowley declared him the male version of jonah mark and said that his only crime was the pursuit of knowledge so he's like he's obviously like well he just had these books and he was just interested in the occult some said that he was it's in a fertility cult but i don't see oh, where that's coming from sake. genuinely his worst crime is getting skin and trying to fix it by making gold which like <laughs> wouldn't we all do you know what i mean it's a bit bloody far-fetched isn't it and I, i'm not sure i believe it i think it's fucking horseshit mate and i think that the real people you should have burned 
and hung at the same time is the fucking grubby little monks who are like, yeah, and then he wanks on the bellies um, and, and then he chopped them up and he kept the faces of the ones that he liked the most. Right, right, fucking lock them up straight away. You, you just, I can't believe you just want to see all these ancient monks hanged. That's what you want. Yeah. You just want to see them swinging from the end of a rope, the little cassocks on blowing fire. in the wind. Don't forget, on that- fire. <laughs> Oh my god, I can't believe that you're calling for this. This is like something I'd call for. What are you What's on happened? about? <laughs> the execution and burning of monks. This I... is like something that that I'd say in a bad mood. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, I think it's absolute. Do you know what? Go to Gilles de Ray was innocent dot blogspot dot com because there's loads of information there. Um, a woman who's sort of dedicating her time to clearing his name i I mean i reckon fine start with the mccann's (laughs) but but (laughs) i'm not getting into that i think it's absolute horseshit and i think it's almost exactly the same as elizabeth bathory and so many people that they basically get so powerful it's a threat to people and then they think right well i can't oust them legally so i'm just going to accuse them of being a pedophile and they've got enough enemies from being successful do you know what i'm saying mate this is me. <laughs> Your biggest mistake you can make is to be successful. It's only a matter of fucking time before I'm accused of being a paedophile. <laughs> and I will not call for your hanging and burning. Oh, people would love it, wouldn't they? Yeah. So it's awful. Gilles de Ray was a war hero who fell in love with Joan of Arc <laughs> and then was accused of being a paedophile. <laughs> I mean, for fuck's sake, you didn't marry the four-year-old. That's pretty compelling evidence. Justice for Gilles de Ray. <laughs> is this is this your uh, is this your thing you're going to take on? Yeah, absolutely. You want free the French one? Free... <laughs> oh, you're going to dig him up and give him a hug? <laughs> no, I would much rather find those fucking monks and put them on trial. <laughs> I honestly, I've never heard such vitriol against ancient monks. I am spun out. Do you not think that, like, if you found those scrawlings, if you had a kid, right, and in the back of their exercise book was written the kind of stuff that the monks had written, bearing in mind from their imagination, you'd be like, okay, (laughs) all right, babes, we're going to go to a psychologist. (laughs) But also, I find it really strange that for a a person who isn't interested in sex to... uh, I don't know why I suddenly went funny then. Person that is non actually, yeah, a person that is non sexual and decided not to have sex would probably write exactly those things. So uh, I've done a U turn completely yeah, on that. Yeah, absolutely. Fucking think about how horny you are before you have sex. It's way hornier <laughs> than when you actually have sex and you're like, oh yeah, that's what it's about. That's nice. I mean, you don't actually think that's nice until you're in your 20s and people can actually do it properly. But like. <laughs> <laughs> but. I- how do you think I feel knowing that when I have sex with my boyfriend, he's thinking of Bart Simpson's bum? Yeah, Bart Simpson's little crossed out butthole. <laughs> do you know what he's imagining? As he's as he's inside you, he's going on like a outer body experience where he's walking over to the fridge and ever so slowly he's peeling off the little cross over Bart's bum. <laughs> oh God, I can't cope. <laughs> I don't know why it's so funny. Oh god! I don't know why it's funny, Dear actually, me. Rachel, because that's a that's a ten year old boy <laughs> who now he's got a cross on his bum. Suggests to me there's obviously been some thought about it. Yeah, absolutely. I think he's, he stood there getting the milk out the fridge and thought, "He's actually got a really nice bum for a cartoon ten year old." Do you know what it's like? It's when I say to my boyfriend when I'm eating a big bag of crisps on the sofa and I go, "Hide these from me," because I know I can't be trusted. <laughs> that's what that cross is on the bum. It's that Tim doesn't trust himself. <laughs> Oh, God. Oh, dear me. I cannot cope. It's too early to think about Bart Simpson's bum. But not for Tim, apparently. (laughs) Apparently he thinks about it all the time. (laughs) Um, Do you think that's why he fancies you, being so tiny, because you've got the bum of a 10-year-old boy? Yeah, I think that's exactly it, yeah. (laughs) And and also, uh, when when we did meet, you know, we used to go to the pub quite a lot, so my complexion was a bit off and I might have looked a bit yellow. So maybe that was another (laughs) thing that he first found attractive. Well, I think the base tone of your skin is is a yellowish colour, isn't it? Like... I've got yeah, mine it is, is actually, yeah. Yeah, mine's like a pinky red and yours is a, a yellowy tones. Well, it's all coming together, isn't it, eh? Eat my bum hole. <laughs> oh, God damn. 
<laughs> oh, well, actually, that's weirdly, that's a tarot sketch that we've written is that we found a thing that can simulate uh, like Bart Simpson's voice. And we've got this thing about someone writing Bart, Bart Simpson pornography and they're like, no, I'm not. And then they're like on the computer and out of the computer it goes, eat my ass. <laughs> and it sounds really funny. <laughs> Oh, I'll tell you what, Timmy's gonna love that. <laughs> Either that or he'll feel attacked. <laughs> oh, oh dear. Well, that's Shield of Eight. So, thanks very much for listening. We hope you got enough of um, enough bummels for this episode. <laughs> and um, please do join us on the live stream show on May 30th. It'd be great to see you there. I think that's it, isn't it? Yeah, but I thought it was going to be a historical romp, that, but it turns out it was horrible. It was a stitch-up job, that's what it was. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on that, actually. I just don't think it happened. It's too far-fetched, isn't it? Didn't. Absolutely didn't. It's absolute uh, horseshit. Well, I thank- believe in Jordan Peterson's power of deductions more than I believe in that, <laughs> that murder. <laughs> Anyway, I'm going to go now because I'm going to uh, I'm going to go down a rabbit hole reading about Pizzagate. I have got a thirst for it this yes. morning after all this. And Tim's g- Tim standing in front of his fridge going down a different rabbit hole. <laughs> Don't. Oh God, that sticker. I bet you, if he listens to this episode, that sticker will disappear. <laughs> Up his bum, probably. Uh, you'll know when he's listened because it disappears from the fridge. Yeah, I can't wait. But thank you for listening. Cheers. And we'll, uh, we'll see you all soon. Bye. Bye.